Hello everyone, this is um, lecture 10. Um, in today's lecture, I'm going to be covering about comparisons and booleans. Um, what it simply means is when you compare, you get a boolean value. right? When you compare, compare A against B, it's either true or it's either false. Uh, so that's where the booleans come, um, they come into play. Uh, the other thing I'll get into is, uh, time permitting, is the if-then-else structure, um, branching you may call it, um, and then uh, nested if, um, and then towards the end, um, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the uh, conditional expression. Um, so stay tuned, um, quite a bit to cover over here. Um, once again, basic and important concept to every uh, programming language out there. It's not just restricted to this one. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into it. So when it comes to the operator, so if you use the less than operator, um, the the result, like I said, is either true or false. Uh, in this case, in the first case, I'm comparing uppercase C uh, with lowercase C. And the lowercase C is greater. It does a lookup for the ASCII representation for each character, and it finds out, hey, you know what? C is greater. Um, so it's true. And uh, so if you notice, the lowercase uh, letter are, are um, they're greater than the uppercase letter, generally speaking. So that's why you have uppercase C um, is less than lowercase C, so that ends up being true. And uh, uppercase D is less than lowercase D, that ends up being true. And if you have a lowercase D, uh, and if I say it's, it's less than uppercase E, that turns out to be false. And if you recall from the previous lecture, uh, a boolean is nothing more than uh, it's a binary it's either one or zero it's built on c so a true is actually one and false is actually um, zero and it gets translated into boolean in c plus plus what we call true and false but in the background is just one and zero the other two operators that i'm going to be talking about is the equal to operator and the not equal to the not equal to operator, you know that you've read about it, but there's some gotchas when you're using the equals to operator because if you use two equal sign, right? So you're comparing one integer against another integer or, or let's say one object with another object, right? Character or whatever um, that object is. And if you use equals equals, you're comparing it against each other. Now, for some reason, if you only have one equal to, well, the problem is instead of comparing it, you've actually assigned it. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you an example of this. So let me just go ahead and jump into the example. Uh, so if you can see over here in this program, I don't really need hello world. I seem to have hello world. Um, almost all the programs that I show you that's not relevant so I have two integers I have I equal to 10 and K equals to 12 and in here I'm using if else and the first thing I do is if I equals equals 10 what this means is I'm comparing the value of I against 10 right if that turns out to be true then I say see out I equals to 10. Otherwise, I say I is not is not equal to 10. Should be 10 actually. And then at the end, I output the value of I. Now let me go ahead and run it and see what happens. Okay, I is equal to 10. The value of I is 10. Now let's say for example, I have this condition right here, okay? And what do you think is going to happen? In this case, we initialize i to 10, but we're checking it against 11. It should come here. It should say i is not equal to 10, and then just say value of i. Okay, that was as expected. Now, let's say, for example, you forget the equals e equals and you only have one equals. So you've made a mistake. Okay, and this could happen. It's a very common mistake people make. But what happens in this case is you, um, let me run it and see what happens. I'll show it to you. So it says 
if i equals 11 i is equal to 10 but then at the end it says value of i is 11 what happened there well you gave it the assignment operator you you made i equal to 11 okay and that expression resulted in a true because that's a proper um, logically and syntactically a correct expression uh, so it turns out to be true and it says hey you've made this assignment it's successful and then it says i is equal to 10 um, and then at the end you notice what happened here the value of i got changed um, that's not what you wanted so you wanted the equals equals operator so one thing to keep in mind is um, the two equal sign versus one equal sign now in this case it you know it, it worked let's say it was able to compile and you had a logical error okay and I'll touch on logical and compilation error in a little bit it was it wasn't a compilation error so things were fine you maybe forgot it you didn't notice it how about the other case if you had something like this 10 equals I what do you think is gonna happen well, it's not that's not proper you cannot assign uh, 10 to I see the compilation error even though I is 10 but I 10 is a constant it's a constant integer and you're trying to assign it a variable I the, the compiler is not going to let you do that it's going to give you uh, an error whereas the the other way was true right I equals to 10 that worked so in some cases you'll get this compilation error whereas in other cases if you've got a logical problem uh, you won't actually and that brings me uh, to a similar question I had on the midterm um, I did grade the midterm so you can go um, I've graded your assignments um, the second assignment I haven't graded yet so there's only one assignment left to grade um, so the first assignment and the midterm are graded so you can check your grade and find out how you're doing so far um, and then I'm going to be assigning well one assignment was due Wednesday I'm going to be assigning another assignment that you can look into but let me just touch upon um, uh, some of the questions uh, that many of you had trouble with one of the questions in the midterm was what's the difference between a syntax error and a compilation error now syntax is missing a semicolon or something wrong with the syntax that's one syntax error or instead of these two I've only have one and in both of these instances if you have a syntax error you are gonna get a compilation error for sure watch it's not gonna compile you've got a syntax error the compiler is gonna complain until you fix the syntax so it's kind of very similar so a syntax error will result in a compilation error now some of you thought there's slight diff you know you the other some of you actually thought the difference between the two is uh, is a logical error one I'm asking one about the compilation error one about the logical so the logical error would be something like I equals to 10 right all right I equals to 11 this is a logical error meaning there's a problem in the logic of my code but the co the compiler isn't going to catch it you have to figure out what the logic and, what, and what's wrong so that's the difference between the two the logical and the syntax error and I think that was one question that most of you had issues with but if you attempted it and you were kind of on the right path I gave you most of the credit for it and that's what I did with another question I don't remember exactly what the question is I'll go back and look at it okay now I remember um, the other one had to do with the ran max so I you know I, one of the question was if I go from one compiler to another or one computer to another why is ran max different uh, well the reason that ran max was different is different compilers have that ran max number differently it's still a big number but it varies from one compiler to another so if I switch from one com computer to the other computer chances are that there's a different compiler um, and that's why you see different ran max um, uh, results now it is possible that you can go from one computer to another and you have the exact same compiler and 
Uh, that's also possible. But generally speaking, you can say that if you know every compiler has that max value uh, defined already, and it's different for different compilers. Um, and then there was another question that I said um, had to do with random number generation is that every time I run this program, I seem to get the same set of numbers uh, again and again. Uh, well, the problem there was I never uh, seeded the rand. If you recall uh, from one of the previous lectures, there is a uh, S rand. Um, what it does is it, see, it seeds it. It gives it a starting point. Uh, to that of the time, current time. So time always changes. Um, so every time you run it, you're going to get a different number. So that's what I was looking for. And But I think, uh, generally speaking, I was pretty happy with all of your performance. I, I think besides one or two, everyone did attempt to answer each and every one of the question. And that's really what you ought to be doing. And if you cannot um, answer a question, Explain your logic, your thought process, so I know what's going on in your head, and and I can give you credit accordingly. I try to give you credit if you're kind of on the right path, and I, I get what you're saying because um, C++ was my first language that I learned, so I know where you guys are coming from and what's going on in your head. So don't leave um, an answer blank. Give it your best shot. Okay. So that was me ranting on about the midterm. But like I said, great job, everyone. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, I'm glad to see the um, how you guys are doing in the course. Okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to cover is the, um, is it the nested if? Not the nested if yet. Uh, let me just go to um, if. Well, it is kind of, yeah, it is. It's the if nested if. Let, let me go back here. Okay. So we have seen the if else, right? So if in the example you saw, if this condition is true, then do this. Otherwise, if the conditions falls, else go something else. But you can have if then else, if then else, if then else, so on and so forth, and and number of times there is no limit. So if condition one is true, then I want to execute here. Else if condition if let's say if that condition is false, I'm going to come down here. Else, if condition two, then execute this block of code. Okay, if both of these conditions fail, I'm going to be in the final else statement. Then you execute this. Um, so that's another way of having if then else in your in your code. And the next example is uh, is something um, where you're going to see this happen. Um, and once again, this is very important, uh, so make sure you get the hang of it. Go to it. Okay, so what am I doing here? In here, all I'm doing is I ask the user to enter a integer, which is one right here. So I first thing I do, I say int number. Okay, I have an integer here. And that's it. And then I say enter an integer. And then I see in taking that integer and if the number is greater than zero then I say you've entered a positive number else right so if the number isn't greater than zero then I come here if the number is less than zero I say you entered a negative number if neither one of them is true then I come over here to the final else and I say you entered zero okay so if the number was not greater than zero or less than zero what are the what are the chances? It's exactly at zero. It's a zero, and this line here is always printed because it's outside uh, the if then else block. And the way you look at this, right? And it's always good to have these parentheses here um, by every if statement. So just from a readability perspective, right? That's why I have this. Uh, now let me go ahead and run this program. I'm going to enter a positive number. You entered a positive number. 214. I think the number, where did it get 214? 
I think the lumber, the number it, I'm exceeding the um, uh, the length of the number. I really need to make it a long number. But anyways, bear with me. Let me not change it. Let me just use a reasonable length size number. So I will do five fifty four fifty four. Okay, you entered a positive number. Now. Right. And as you can see, this line is always printed, with, which is outside of the if, if then else block. Let me see what happens when I enter a negative number. Okay, you enter a negative number. Um, now, what happens if I enter exactly zero? You entered zero. And see, the way I was able to find out if it's zero is first I check if it's greater than zero. Then I check if it's less than zero. But if it's neither one of those, chances are you're sure at this point um, it's a zero. I mean, you can pretty much change this around. You, I mean, zero doesn't have to be at the bottom. You can say if the number equals equals zero, then you enter it zero. If it's less than zero, you enter it a negative number. And instead of here, the final statement, you could say you enter it a positive number. Um, but the idea here is to illustrate the if then else, um, if then else block. Okay, now that we've got that down, uh, there is this concept of the conditional operator. Expression one, question mark, expression two, colon, expression three, semicolon. Well, what does it mean, okay? Expression one, the way you go about doing this is you give the compiler a, an expression, okay? A less than B, A greater than B, I equals to 10 or whatever a statement which is going to result in either true or false. If it's true, right, then expression 2 is going to come into play. So if you say i equals 10 here, and i is not equal to 10, then it's going to, i is going to be equals to whatever expression 3 is. If i equals 10 is true, then i gets assigned expression 2. Now this, you know, when I'm explaining this to you, I know it might sound slightly confusing, uh, but let me illustrate that with an example. It will become uh, much clearer. My third example here is this one. Okay. First, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the if else block, and then I'm going to take the if else out and then use the conditional operator. Um, this will also illustrate to you that the usage of um, the conditional operator actually lets you get away from if then else. You reduce some lines of code and it's uh, it's once you get the hang of it, it's uh, straightforward to understand. Now in this case, what am I doing? Um, in x, y equals 10. So I've got two variables that I declared and y is equal to 10, x is not initialized y is 10 then I'm, I'm come in here I say if y um, less than um, now let me do this here actually let me not change it okay anyways let let's continue so if y less than 10 then x equals to 30 Otherwise, x is equal to 40. Simple as that, right? And then here I say, what's the value of x? So run it. Value of x is 40, right? Because y was not less than 10. So this one failed, so it came to the x and it assigned 40. Now, uh, you know, it's easier to copy paste this. Instead of going through all that line, all those lines of code, if you remember, that's how you comment things. 
multi like multi line comment. That's the syntax. What's going on? I cannot type. Okay. So here what I'm saying is x is equals to then I give it an expression. Y less than ten. If that is true, then x is going to be equal to thirty. Otherwise, it's going to be equal to forty. Now watch what happens. Same impact, right? Same thing as as in my if else, because this turned out to be false. That's why I took this. Now, if if y was less than ten, right, then it would be thirty. Okay. Since we're going good on time, I figured that we'll cover some more operations related to string. Uh, first one I want to cover is the find operation. And that is the syntax that you see. Um, you know, string, the name of the string that you've declared dot find. And then a second string. So this is the string that you're searching within. And this is the string that you're searching for. Let's say, for example, you have a hello world. Um, string right so in hello world you might be looking for world or O or portion of the string or whatever um, and then uh, what this method does is in string one it will look for the occurrence of string two and it will tell you the position of when the string two starts okay let's go ahead and um, show you an example here you see this um, so in this program, I declared uh, a string called str. I say this is a C++ programming class, uh, new line character. And then I say position of the programming word is, and then here is where I use uh, str, which is the original string, okay, that find the word programming. So in this string, what I'm looking for is for the word programming but find is going to return a uh, a position uh, where the program starts. So let me run this. Position of the programming word is 12. So if you count from here all the way to here, you will see that programming starts at position 12. Okay, so that that's what it does. It gives you a number of uh, where the uh, position is going to start. Now one thing to keep in mind, uh, well that's in the next one, okay? So hopefully this one's clear, a very useful method, you're going to be using it quite often uh, to find um, substrings within the string. I mean you can even, um, you could have even done this, okay. It still gives me 12 because it's at, the uppercase P is at the same position. Uh, it's going to give you some garbage, some huge number if, in this compiler that is. So if, um, so it's case sensitive, right? So I'm looking for a lowercase p. It's not going to find it. See what it does. So it give you some long, long number. So this you, here you know that I mean this is way out of the bounds. I mean it's like a long number right here. Uh, so in this case it didn't find it. So keep in mind it's case sensitive. If you get some garbage number like this, uh, which is completely outside the bounds of uh, the string, you know, it's uh, it didn't find it. Okay, uh, so I guess that you can do uh, you can do uh, a you know portion of a string or just one character, whatever it is that you're looking for, and find will give you the the position of that. Uh, that's one. Now there's also another find that takes in everything that we covered in the example but then it takes in an extra parameter it also takes in position okay now keep in mind string one is the string that you're searching in okay that's your source string right there string two is what you're searching for and in position is the starting position so you say in string one let's say this position is 10 in string one i want to start at the uh, at the 10th uh, place in that string and let's go forward from there. So what I mean by that, I use another example. In this, I have a string 
Okay, mango is my favorite fruit. New line character after that. Position the fruit is. Um, and so this is, I'm saying at the position zero. Okay, I want to start at position zero and work my way up and look for um, the word fruit. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. Roughly at twenty-one. I think I might have miscounted there, but look, rough realign. Roughly around twentieth position, twenty-first position is where I'll see uh, fruit. So I start off with zero here. Okay, twenty-first position is where the word fruit starts from. I could have done. 11 okay it's still 21 right so all the second uh, parameter signifies is that what you're saying is look I want to start at position 11 of the string and you can totally do that um, and once again if you've got this number to be out of bounds right uh, the, bigger than the size of the string it's going to give you that uh, that same long garbage number uh, it's because it didn't find it as simple as that. Okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to cover is the substring. Substring is, is uh, it takes in the position, the length. Uh, actually, this will be illustrated better via an example. Now, and here, uh, let's walk through this, okay? using namespace std I have a string called geeks then I say string one dot substring one two three copy three characters of s1 from position one watch what happens So I took string one, which is a source string geeks, and starting at position one up until three, right? Three is up to k. So I started off at position one, and then went all the way to three positions. I take a substring of it, a portion of that string out, and I store that in R. So that's what substring does it gives you a portion of the string you know I could have said well you start at position 0 give me 10 1 2 3 4 5 5 okay it's still geeks why because I started at 0 and I went to the length of this 1 2 3 4 5 well it and I copied all of that in string 1 and they'll make a whole lot of sense. I could have done this starting at three and then two positions after that. KS, yes. okay. The last two only. I could say just one character. Okay, just K. So hopefully uh, you get the hang of it. Um, you're taking a portion of the string and I'm storing it in string R. That's what that is. Okay, string R equals to S1 dot substring started position 3, go one position after that, uh, and then store the value in R. Okay, another very useful method. Uh, one thing that I wanted to cover in here is, you know, as you're creating strings, you might need to add a tab or all these special characters. And one of the ones that always kind of uh, gets tricky um, for the students is, how do you insert double quotes in the string, right? That's a big problem because the string by itself is, you know, the way we define that we put a double quote at the end, double quote after that. Well, can you do this? Watch what happens. Let's take all of this off. It's not as simple as you guys might think. Okay, S1 and L puts a new line. See, that didn't work. The way you go about adding these special characters is if you want double quotes slash double quote. That's how you get eight double quotes in it. See, Geek's got a double quote in it. So 
slash represents that whatever is after it is a special character. Like say you wanted to do this. Greeks. Um, test. Okay. Now I do this. Two. Okay, so now if I do without this, I may get a space right there. There is some space there. Now I'm going to try to add a tab. Watch what happens. You see that tab that occurred right there? So, slash, and then after that is a special character. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, okay.